Hello everybody, welcome. I'm Ben Powell, I'm the director of the Free Market Institute, and pleased to have you here at our second public lecture of this semester. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I'll just preview what we have coming up next. Jim Audison on November 1st, uh, speaking about his book, Honorable Business. And I can't read on this poster from here, but it's gonna be somewhere on campus. Right here in Rawls, there we go, multi-purpose room. Uh, I couldn't, the screen's tough. Uh, and then also, I get to tell you about our first one of the spring semester, uh, which is our 10th anniversary, and kicking off that is going to be 2002 Nobel Prize winner in economics, Vernon Smith. He spoke here on our, our first year on campus, and we'll be very pleased to have him back at an event on January 30th. Uh, I believe that one's over in the Pensy Mercury Center. And now I'll introduce our, our speaker for today, Tom Hogan's uh, senior fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research. He was formerly the chief economist for the U.S. Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. Uh, his primary uh, areas of research are regulation and monetary policy. He's held a variety of positions in both academic and private sectors. He was previously a fellow at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. He was an assistant professor of finance at Troy University. And actually, when Free Market Institute got started 10 years ago, he was an assistant professor up at uh, West Texas A&M at New Canyon, uh, where he used to come down to some of our events then and bring some of his students with him. Uh, he also has worked for Merrill Lynch's Commodity Trading Group and investment firms in the U.S. and Europe, and was a consultant for the World Bank and a fellow with the Cato Institute. He earned his Ph.D. in economics from George Mason University, and he holds bachelor's and master's degrees in business administration, from another public university in Texas who will remain nameless, but who has lost to Texas Tech in both football and basketball the last time they visited <laughs> our campus. Uh, and with that, uh, very pleased, please join me in welcoming Tom Hogan. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. You guys hear me okay? Okay. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming. I'm, I'm excited so many people are interested in hearing about the Fed and inflation, although I know a lot of people are here for extra credit, so that's fine. I hope it'll be interesting. You know, just a couple of years ago, uh, people were not really interested in talking about the Fed because inflation had been low and we thought we had figured out the problem of inflation and it would never be a problem again. But obviously that has changed. A lot of things have changed in the last couple of years, right? And this is definitely one of them that now we suddenly have a lot of inflation and people are asking, What's going on? What's causing this? Is there anything the Fed can do about it? So I'm going to talk today about a topic that is mission creep at the Fed. How the Fed has kind of changed what it's doing a little bit and how that has potentially contributed to inflation. So I want to start off by just saying a couple of things about what is the Fed and what does it do? And then some reasons we are having inflation today. Um, a couple of different reasons. Some partly due to supply shocks that has been an ongoing issue since the pandemic, partly because of some bad predictions of the Fed, they didn't understand what was going on, but then the issue of mission creep that I'm gonna talk about at the end and can see, okay, which of these things are really big problems that are contributing to inflation? And at the very end, I'll, I'll say just a little bit about what we can do to potentially reform the Fed to try to improve this in the future. Um, so, to start off with, the Federal Reserve is the central bank of the United States, and so they are in charge of the money supply. The central bank has a uh, monopoly on base money, and so one of the things that they do is try to control the amount of money in the economy. And so they, uh, they control the amount of base money, and they can change that by buying and selling bonds. Up to 2008, that was their primary tool for trying to affect the economy, buying and selling bonds. They buy bonds, they're taking bonds out of the, the economy and putting money into the economy to try to stimulate the economy and get it to grow more, or as the economy is growing, to just try to support that growth, right? And so this was really their primary tool. Um, they would buy and sell bonds to try to influence interest rates, influence lending in the economy. After 2008, they changed this a little bit. They continued buying and selling bonds, but on a much, much larger scale, what we call quantitative easing, right? So instead of buying millions or even billions of bonds, they're now buying trillions of dollars and injecting trillions of dollars into the economy. Um, that's something that they had never done before, on a much, much larger scale than they had ever done. 
The other thing is that instead of just trying to influence interest rates, they're actively controlling short-term interest rates. They're setting the rate that they pay banks uh, for short-term reserves, and so they're, they're really controlling short-term interest rates rather than just trying to influence the economy. They're actually setting that number now. And so they're trying to do these things to improve the economy. They want to provide enough money to help the economy grow, but they also think that they can try to uh, reduce the volatility, reduce the business cycles, that if we're going into a recession, maybe they can try to put some more money into the economy so that we don't fall as far, or that we recover more quickly. Or if the economy is growing too quickly and they're afraid there might be a, a, a bubble or a housing boom, they might want to try to slow the money growth um, so that we don't have a big boom in the bus, right? Um, it's debatable whether they're any good at that, right, at controlling business cycles and whether they do a good job at that, but that's at least partly their goal. And so they have the, this mandate from Congress uh, that's known as the dual mandate, where Congress says, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail later, but basically they have two goals. One is to keep prices stable, that is to keep inflation low. And when we say inflation, we're talking about rising prices. And so they have a goal of price stability. The other goal is maximum so these thing, things are goals that they have in mind when they're trying to think about, okay, what is the state of the economy? Are we having a cycle? Is it, is it, uh, are we going into a recession? Or are we moving too much? And how can the Fed try to influence the economy to dampen that and promote price stability? But obviously, they've not done a good job with price stability lately. Uh, we're certainly having a lot of inflation which is a very important topic and why everyone's now paying attention to the Fed and in every single meeting that they have, they're, they're covered on the news and suddenly a much more important topic because of this problem with inflation. So you know, what's causing inflation here? I said before, we'll talk about three things. One is supply shocks. One is did they just have bad information and not understand what was happening in the economy or did they change their mandate? In terms of supply shocks, this was definitely something that was an issue coming out of the uh, COVID crisis and recession. Right? There were definitely problems. When you shut down the entire economy for six months or a year, it's really hard to just start it back up again. And there were some um, problems getting certain businesses and certain industries up and going, and then others just doing very quickly, right? Um, but definitely early on, at least, there was a problem with supply. But when we, when we see problems of supply, this is typically, you know, there's not enough of some industry or not enough labor or something like that, and that's going to that's gonna drive up prices, potentially. But usually it's very short term. Transitory is the term that we often use, um, and that the Fed was using early on, saying, look, this is going to be something short term, right? Um, that hasn't turned out to be the case, right? Pretty clear, we're a couple years into this now, and it seems like inflation is persistent. It's not something that just happened for a short term, it's something that's going on. The second thing is that supply problems tend to be industry specific, right? And so if we're seeing prices rising all over the economy, that's probably something that has to do with the money supply, which affects the whole economy. It's not something where there's some problem supplying some particular good, right? So we can look and see what does the evidence say about these things? Does the evidence say it's transitory? Does the evidence say there's specific industry problems? Well, the transitory thing, uh, is definitely not true anymore. Early on, the Fed was saying, Jerome Powell, who was the Fed chair, he said in early 2021, inflation has risen largely reflecting transitory factors. And this was his message. Every time he talked, he's like, transitory, transitory. He put it in all their statements. We believe everything's transitory, right? But after six months or a year, it's hard to believe that that's still transitory. A couple years on, it's By November of 2021, he's saying, it's time to retire when we're transitory. Uh, okay, we, you know, maybe maybe we thought it was going to be short term, but after a whole year, it seems like that's not really the case. And by the end of 2021, they were saying this is actually going to be with us for a few years. Um, now he's been saying we are very far from our inflation target, right? Like now they're he's admitting, okay, no longer transitory. This is a much much bigger, long lasting, persistent problem than we thought. Um, and so definitely the Fed is playing some role. But they're still saying, oh, this, there's still supply problems. Even now, Powell is still saying, yeah, there's problems with supply that are causing this too. 
So we can look at these industries and see where are these problems are. They isolated or are they widespread in the economy? We can look at two specific examples. One is oil, and the other is um, auto computer chips. That early on during the pandemic, there was a problem that auto manufacturers couldn't get computer chips from China, and so they couldn't produce parts. So both of these things are areas where we can look and say, okay, how big is this problem? Is it you know, industry specific? If we look at the price of oil, um, this is from pre-pandemic in 2019, early 2020, the shaded area is um, the recession. And this is the price of oil uh, on the side here, starting around $50. It dies down during the pandemic and, and the recession after that. But it, it rebounds pretty quickly. And it's stable for a little while um, before increasing. And you know the this is obviously something that a lot of people have paid attention to. Um, it's something that politicians love to blame. You know, Biden was saying, oh, this is all caused by oil, all this inflation. It's Putin's price hike, right? And he's like, oh, this, this all happened when Russia invaded Ukraine. That's what caused all these problems. Um, but it looks like it was happening before then, right? I mean, if we look at this in January of 2021, the price of oil was $45. Before Russia invaded Ukraine in the start of February of 2022, it was 95. So it had already more than doubled before that war even started. So the idea that this oil price is up just because of the war in Ukraine is obviously not true. Right? Most of that increase happened long before that, happened all through 2021 when the price of everything was going up. So it seems like the oil is not what's driving the price of everything else. Everything in the economy is going up, and that's you know, potentially and the war affected it too, did shoot up after February. Um, I made this chart like, I don't know, a month ago and it's since come down to about $80. Um, and so now the price of oil is actually falling. It seems like you know, that wasn't really a good excuse to be causing widespread inflation across the economy. Right? If we looked at what was happening early in, the pin, uh, early in the recovery, so this is May of 2021, it did look like oil was a big part of this. In May of 2021, the consumer price index was up 5%. And everyone's like, oh my god, 5%? This is like the end of the right, and it's much worse now. And so, you know, at the time we thought 5% was just awful. But if we looked at that time, it did look like, you know, energy is the main thing that's driving this. But even if you exclude food and energy prices, which are volatile components of the consumer price index, all items excluding food and energy was still at 3.8%. So the Fed's long-run target is 2%. And so even excluding energy, we're still like almost twice what the Fed wanted early in the recovery, right? But actually, if you look at that uh, all else, uh, if excluding food and energy, actually, if you look at this, here's where the auto chip problem came in. Because if you broke this down into subcomponents of the CPI, it turned out it was almost entirely driven by auto prices. Um, Cars, used cars, auto insurance, uh, every, rental cars, everything related to auto prices was skyrocketing at that time. So if you took those things out, it was actually um, slightly less than the Fed's target of 2%. But very soon after this, prices started going up everywhere. And so I think early on, the Fed took this wrongly looking, look, this is only supply. This is just a supply problem that has nothing to do with price. But within a couple of months, it became clear that that was not true. Just a few months after this, we saw prices rising across the economy. If we fast forward to a year later, the following June, we see, look, energy is still a big part of this. But again, excluding food and energy prices, now it's up almost 6%. So now three times the Fed's 2% target. So instead of just being a short-term problem where inflation and prices started going down, it started going up. It was going up even more um, during that year. And so if we looked at the subsectors at that time, every subsector of the CPI was up. Actually, one, I left one of them off here that was um, education commodities was actually negative because you know, if you shut down schools for two years, no one buys school supplies, right? And so like that one was negative. Everything else was way up. Most of them are 4%, 6%, double the Fed's 2% target or more. And so it became very clear that this is a widespread problem this is a persistent, not a transitory problem. So the things that we would think of as being supply issues just don't seem to be true. Um, what about the issue of 
forecast. So, so Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, has said, look, we just made bad predictions. And people say, look, they just, they just didn't understand. You know, they saw, like I showed about early on, it was computer chips, and it was oil, and they thought that was the only problem. Um, is that plausible? I, I don't know. So this is a quote from uh, Powell in March of 2022. So this year he says, why have forecasts been so far off? In my view, an important part of the explanation is that forecasts are widely underestimated the severity and persistence of supply side. For, so even in March of this year, he's still saying, like, oh no, it's still supply side. It seems weird, right? After everything, it's, he, he already knows it's not transitory, it's persistent. He already knows it's going up everywhere across the economy, but he's still blaming supply. Um, he later said, I think we now understand better how little we understand about inflation. That seems weird. I mean, Milton Friedman told us that inflation is always an everywhere monetary phenomenon. So it's the Fed's job. How could you not know that, right? And he says, everybody had the same model, which was the Phillips curve, and it wasn't able to produce high inflation. So he's like, everyone got it wrong. It wasn't just us. No. Lots of people were saying, like, what you're doing is crazy. You know, this is going to cause a ton of inflation. And that just didn't work out. Okay. But they're still saying, like, oh, well, it was just our models. No, we just didn't have the right information. Uh, but is that true? Let's let's uh, look at what some of their models say. So what we're showing here is this is a this is the median projection by the FOMC members, the Federal Open Market Committee, is the group at the Fed, the people that make the decisions about monetary policy. And so we we ask them four times a year. Okay, what do you predict is going to be happening over the next couple of years uh, with GDP and with inflation? And so this is their prediction. I don't know how well you guys can see this, but. Um, 2018, 2019, 2020, those were the actual values at that time. And then they're making a prediction about what they think is going to happen in the next couple of years. So the green line is June of 21. They believe, when they're halfway through 21, they believe, okay, well, we're going to have 3% inflation this year, and then it's going to come down to our 2% target. Everything's fine, right? Uh, if we fast forward to the next meeting in September, now they're like, okay, we were wrong. It's going to be a little bit higher. It's going to be about 3.8%, but then it's going to come back to our 2% target if it's fine. And then the next meeting, okay, we were wrong. Uh, it's going to come to like 4 point something percent, and then it's going to come down to like 2.5, and, and then it's going to come down to 2. Everything's fine. What do you think they said the next time? Okay, we were wrong, right? They actually, you, this is the actual uh, number for uh, 2021, and you know, it's like almost 5%. So even their previous projection in December of the year, when they're in the last month of the year and they've got almost all the information, they still hugely underestimated what was happening in that year, even though it was almost over, right? That's crazy. And of course, then they're like, oh yeah, and not only were we wrong about last year, but next year is gonna be a lot worse too. And then, then everything's gonna be fine, right? But persistently, like every single time, Inflation comes at higher than they expected, higher than they expected, higher than they expected. Like, how many times did that have to happen before you realize, like, okay, we were wrong about this, we need to change it. Like, this is actually our fault and not just, you know, mistake. So to, to say that, oh, they just didn't have the information, they did. Every time they found out that they were wrong and inflation came in higher than they expected, that was information telling them, this is caused by money, not by us. But they just ignored it. They didn't change their policy until March when they had that grave projection. You know, they've been seeing for more than six months consistently overestimating their projections, inflation coming in too high, too high, too high, and they didn't do anything. Right? And so that's on them for not changing their policy after all those mistakes. Here you can see the red line here is inflation. And so you know, early in um, 2021, it starts to go up. And then it really starts to take off, right? But in the summer, it does kind of stop for a second, and maybe they thought, oh, it's going to come back down, but then it kept going up, right? And this is the rate of inflation. So this is not the price level. This means prices are actually growing faster and faster. It's accelerating over this period, not dying off like they were thinking. And so they should have known. Every time they get a new data point here, this is, hey, we should change our minds, and they did. When did they, when did they start actually changing their policy? That blue line is when they finally raised interest rates way out there at the end. Right? That's how long it took them to actually change their policy, being persistently wrong for a So it doesn't seem like this was, oh yeah, we just had bad information. This seems like something that the Fed is doing that it's, it's, you know, 
their fault for not changing the policy. They should know. Okay, so then what did they do and why didn't they change their policy? Okay. Why didn't they realize they were wrong or was there another reason? Um, let's talk about their mission and how they changed that. So the Federal Reserve Act that is written by Congress and um, assigns the Fed's uh, monetary policy objectives, it says their objectives are to promote effectively the goals of maximum employment, stable prices, and long-term moderate, uh, moderate long-term interest rates. Um, now, moderate long-term interest rates actually isn't something that the Federal Reserve has very much influence over. Um, they really control money which affects the economy in the short term. The only, the only way that it really affects long-term interest rates is if they're creating a ton of inflation and so like in the 1970s, you know, maybe long-term interest rates are going up because people expect a lot of inflation. So as long as things aren't getting out of control, they really don't have any influence over that. What they're really looking at is the employment goal and the price of money. Right? They're looking at the unemployment rate and they're looking at inflation and they're trying to keep those things down. Right? So that's really, when we talk about the dual mandate, we say, okay, the Fed has these two goals assigned by Congress. They're trying to keep inflation low and they're trying to keep unemployment low. But even then, even with just two goals, that's already one too many, right? Because if you're wrong about inflation, you can just say like, oh, well, we were worried about unemployment. Like, that was really the problem. And if unemployment is high, he's like, well, we were just worried about inflation, you know, this time. And so they can constantly do this bait and switch thing where whenever they're wrong, they just say, oh, well, we were just worried about the other thing, right? So they've already got a get out of jail free card just by having a dual mandate instead of a single mandate. So that's, that's already a problem. Um, but these seem like reasonable goals. You know what you don't see here? Inequality. That's not something the Fed really has anything to do with. You know, I said earlier that they control the money supply, they, they control short-term interest rates, and they try to influence the whole economy, uh, whether we're going into a recession or whether we're afraid of a, a boom or potential you know, uh, housing boom and bust or something like that. They're worried about these big picture things in the economy really hard for them to try to target something like specific sectors in the economy, like groups of people. They've said, in fact, in the past, they, you know, Fed chairs have always said, like, look, this is something that, that we can't affect. People for years have been saying, hey, what can you do about income inequality or, or uh, employment inequality? And they say, like, nothing. We, we only control the money supply. It affects the entire economy at the same time. We can't, like, pick out one specific group um, and affect them. And they also say, like, that's also not our job. You know, we have these two things that are signed by Congress. Congress didn't assign us to manage the problem of inequality. Um, so this is a problem. I mean, this what we're seeing here is the red line here is the average unemployment rate, um, and the blue line is the uh, Black and African American unemployment rate. It's higher, right? Like that is a problem. But it's just not really anything that the Fed can do anything about. And they've said this for a long time. So Ben Bernanke, who was the, the Fed chair in uh, you know, the 2008 financial crisis and the Great Recession, he said, policies designed to affect the distribution of wealth and income are appropriately the province of elected officials, not the Fed. Okay? That's the job for Congress to try to work on. All we do is work on the money supply. And we're trying to you know, meet these two goals of low inflation and low unemployment. That's what we do. Um, if Congress wants to do something else, they can do that. Maybe. Janet Yellen said, a stronger labor market will improve the status of all groups in the labor market, but there are deeper structural reasons these trends of, of inequality continue. You know? So I'm like, look, that's just not something that monetary policy can, can fix here. Um, I actually, when, when Janet Yellen said this, this was in the uh, testimony before Congress, um, when I was chief economist at the at Senate Banking Committee, so I was actually sitting right behind Senator Shelby, who was the chair of the committee at the time, when, when they asked about this. And what happened was, there was a coordinated effort to try to get Janet Yellen to commit to the Fed doing something about inequality. And so uh, there were a bunch of different senators that were all asking the same question, like, what are you gonna do about the racial unemployment gaps? And the first couple of times she was asked, she said, like. That's, that's really important, you're right, that's an issue, you know, we'll look into it, we'll see what we can do. I think that's very important, we're, we're studying it, Senator. Um, and after about the third time, she was like, 
look, there's nothing we can do about that. You know, she's like, look, that, we, can't, we can't fix that. This is a structural problem. It's not something that has anything to do with monetary policy. And when she said that, I was like, yes, finally, some honesty from her. And then they said, what, what should we do? And she said, the government should spend more on education and job skills. And I was like, no, that's the wrong answer. But well, you know, she's like a big government Democrat. Um, but when she was at the Fed, she was saying like, look, this isn't something that we can do, right? Now she's, she's the Secretary of the Treasury. And so she is trying to do um, more reforms that would be about inequality, but she can do that at the Treasury, right? At the Fed, she's like, look, we can't do that. That's not the Fed's job, and it's not something, even if we wanted to, that we could do anything about. You know, she's, and she's serious about this. Like, this is something, an issue that she studies as an academic um, for years, and so, you know, she, she understands, like, look, she would definitely love to do something about that, but that just, more recently, Jerome Powell, the current Fed chair, said, we don't really have the tools that can address dis, uh, distri <laughs> distributional disparate outcomes as well as fiscal policy. A tight labor market is probably the best that the Fed can foster to go after that problem. And look, when we make the economy good, it's good for everyone, right? And that's that's like the best we can do. We can only affect the whole economy we can't target specific sectors. Um, and yet, there's still a ton of political pressure on the Fed to do this. So this is what Joe Biden said. He said, I believe the Fed should add to its current responsibility uh, and aggressively target persistent racial gaps in jobs, wages, wealth, and revise its hiring and employment practices to achieve greater diversity at all levels of the institution. And so he's like, look, I think the Fed needs to be targeting this goal. Even though they've said for years, his own Treasury, Treasury Secretary is like, look, thank you. Um, Elizabeth Warren, in a bill, this is a bill that she proposed, the uh, Federal Reserve Racial and Economic Equality Act. This bill requires the Federal Reserve Board to carry out its duties in a manner that supports the elimination, not just reduction, but the elimination of racial and ethnic disparities in employment, income, wealth, and access to the public. Elimination. So she wants the Fed to redistribute wealth. That's that's like crazy. That's not something that the Fed has anything to do with at all. They're the central bank. They only manage the money supply, right? This bill already passed the House and you know, is only like in, a, in, a, in the Senate now, only a few votes away from potentially passing and becoming law, right? Assigning the Fed an impossible goal that it has nothing to do with it is, is close to becoming law. So, that seems pretty weird. I mean, the Fed has repeatedly said, look, we can't do this. It has nothing to do with us, and it's not our job. And yet, they decided to do it anyway. Uh, they changed their mandate in August of 2020 to reflect uh, a change in the way that they describe maximum employment. So they changed their phrasing of maximum employment to say, um, Maximum level of employment is a broad-based and inclusive goal that is not directly in their interest. So when, when Powell gave the, the talk that introduced this new policy, he specifically talked about racial wage gaps and what the pressure should be. And so you know, they said, now, OK, we're going to start targeting the, the, the gap. The thing that we said is impossible for us to do, we're going to try to do that. The other thing that they did at the same time was um, they changed their inflation goal is that the committee seeks to achieve inflation that averages 2% over time. So they previously were trying to hit 2% in any single year. Now they changed it to say, oh, well, we'll let it run a little bit above 2% for a little while, or we'll let it go a little bit below 2% for a little while, um, as long as it's 2% over time. So that's different, right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue that this was kind of necessary to achieve the, the maximum employment the way they defined it. So what does that mean? Like, you know, they they said, well, we can't fix this problem of the racial wage gap. If we look back to the chart um, where the black and African American uh, unemployment rate is higher, what we see here is in times when the unemployment rates are high, that gap is bigger, and when times when unemployment rates are low, that gap is smaller. And so what they said was, we're going to push for maximum employment. We're going to push the economy until all unemployment rates are low because that's when the gap is low. The problem is, like, that was 
you know, good, just prior to the pandemic, we actually had the lowest minority unemployment rates ever in the United States. And so, you know, that seems like a good idea, except that that happened over a decade of growth. And what the Fed tried to do after the pandemic was squeeze an entire decade into one or two years. He said, we're just gonna stimulate the economy until we get maximum employment. And if we have some inflation, that's okay, because we've changed our inflation goal, where we don't have to hit 2%. We can let inflation run a little bit hot for a little while in order to achieve maximum employment. And so this is what Powell said repeatedly. He kept saying over and over, maximum employment. That's what we're going for. Um, in March 2021, he said, US will not reach maximum employment this year. Uh, we're not intending to raise interest rates until we see those conditions fulfilled. So we're going to keep interest rates at zero until we get to super, super low unemployment rates. That's the Fed's goal. Even in November of 2021, remember, this is after they've seen repeatedly months of inflation coming in higher than expected, higher than expected. Even at that time, he says, the U.S. could reach maximum employment by mid-2022. So even at the end of the year, when they're seeing all this employment, and they should, again, know that it's their fault by that time, he's saying, we're going to keep interest rates low for another six months or so until we hit this maximum employment goal. It's fine that we're having a little bit of inflation. The, the employment goal is more. Uh, he changed his tune by January. Just a few months later, he said, the economy no longer needs or wants very accommodative policies that we have in place. This is what he said at his confirmation hearing, where they were confirming him again to stay Fed chair for another four years. He said, the economy no longer wants or needs this accommodative policy. But just a few weeks later, the Fed had a vote and Powell encouraged them to keep interest rates at zero. And continue, at this time they were still buying bonds, they were still expanding the money supply. So even though he's saying the economy does not want or need our accommodation, they continue doing it. And this is part of his goal. Look, we've we'll, we got to get to maximum employment. We're just going to keep putting more and more money in. We're going to keep expansionary monetary policy until we get maximum. Okay, so, uh, oh, yeah. And then by April of 2020, he's like, okay, it's out of control. Job market's too hot. You know, now he's saying all kinds of things about how inflation and jobs are uh, just way too hot. Okay, so the, this, is where, this is why that inflation target was important. You know, previously, the Fed had, had, a, had a goal it wasn't assigned by Congress. It was their own stated goal. That's why they were able to change it. Um, Congress said, you know, stable prices is your goal. And the Fed said, we're going to hit 2% inflation each year. That's our, our target. But then they changed it and said, OK, we're going to hit 2% over time. Okay? And so this allowed them to say, all right, even though inflation's high, we're going to continue to push for the maximum. Okay. Um, so here's, here's what their policy said. Following periods when inflation has been running persistently below 2%, appropriate monetary policy will likely aim to achieve inflation moderately above 2% for some time. Okay? So when we're below 2%, then later on we're going to go above 2 That seems to imply that when you're above 2 like you are now, that in next year or two you're going to go below 2 right? That, that's what you would think. I mean, it, inflation was low in 2020. It came in below the 2% target at 1.48%. And so that means average, average means that, well, the next year it's going to be above 2%, right? But in 2022, it came, uh, sorry, in 2020, yeah, 2021, it came in a lot above 2%. So does that mean that it's going to be below 2% the next year? It should if they're keeping an average. Um, but no, actually, that's, that's not what they're doing. They're saying if it's below, the next year we're going to let it be high. If it's above, the next year we're going to let it be high. So as long as it's too high, they don't care, right? That's the Fed's official policy. Powell was actually specifically asked about this, um, and that's what he said. There's nothing in our framework about having inflation run below 2%. If it's too low, we're going to crank it up. If it's too high, we're going to let it stay high, maybe even crank it up some more, right? That seems like that's a problem. Again, if their previous policy had been in place, they had to hit 2% inflation every year, they wouldn't have been allowed to do this. But because they changed their rule, they were allowed to say, we're not at maximum employment yet. We're going to keep, despite all this high inflation, we're going to keep interest rates low. We're going to keep buying bonds, um, even though inflation is increasing by okay. okay. So that's, I think, you know, this, this change in their policies 
seems to be what's really motivating them. I mean, the, the supply problems, like yes, they were a problem early in the pandemic, and they're still a little bit of a problem today, but most of the price increases that we're seeing, you know, they're not supply. They're, they're, they're persistent, not transitory. They're happening all over the economy. So it just doesn't seem plausible that that's a supply problem. This is a monetary problem caused by the Fed's bad policies. Um, the second reason of Fed just not knowing and not understanding what was going on, that also doesn't seem plausible. You know, they kept seeing inflation come in too high again, again, and again. And even in January when Powell said, the market no longer wants what we're doing, they kept doing it anyway, right? So to say, oh, well, we just didn't know, that doesn't seem plausible. But this, the change in policy, I mean, that's what they're telling us, right? Powell was saying over and over, look, this new maximum employment, targeting inequality is, is our goal, right? And we're gonna ignore inflation in order to try to meet that goal. And so they were willing to ignore, ignore inflation. They were, they were trying to do something that they had previously said they couldn't do. Um, and I think that is a major cause of you know, inflation because, hey, that's what they were telling us. Right? It's not a mystery, it's what Powell said. Okay, so that's, that's the main um, change in the Fed's mandate that I think was really important. But there are a lot of other changes as well. There were a lot of other political objectives and changes that the Fed made in the last couple of years um, that I think are, are problematic. Uh, one of them had to do with emergency lending. So in the 2008 financial crisis, the Federal Reserve was surprised at the extent of the crisis and created all these new lending facilities. We're gonna, we're gonna lend to banks, we're gonna lend to money markets, we're gonna lend to non-banks, like all these new tools so they could lend to all these financial companies because you know, it was a financial crisis. Uh, the COVID crisis was not a financial crisis. And yet, they said, this is an emergency, we're gonna declare it a financial crisis anyway. And when you look at what they were saying at the time, they were saying, oh, well, the, the market's really volatile. Well, yeah, the stock market's collapsing, like everybody's selling, stock, stock prices are falling, um, but that doesn't make it a financial crisis. And banks weren't having trouble lending to each other, that doesn't, it's not a financial crisis. And yet, they were willing to invoke these emergency tools, um, despite the fact that there was really no need for them. And part of the reason that they did that, I think, was political. So previously they had said, um, look, the Fed is only lending to banks. We're the central bank, we're the regulator of the US banking system, and so when we have a financial crisis, we're gonna lend to banks. We might, on occasion, lend to non-bank companies if they're tied to the banking system. So for example, in 2008, the insurance company AIG, there were a lot of banks that were dealing with that company and when AIG was gonna fail, they at least argued, well, look, if AIG fails, all these other banks are gonna fail and so we need to lend to this non-bank company, right? But they didn't wanna, they didn't wanna do that a lot. Uh, in fact, Ben Bernanke, who was the chair at that time, was asked to bail out the US automakers. They said, look, GM's gonna fail. That's gonna be bad for the economy. The economy's your job. You need to get in there and bail out GM. And Ben Bernanke said, nope, not our job. He said, sorry, that's not the, the Fed's responsibility. If Congress wants to bail out GM, then that's fine, they can do that. But the Federal Reserve, we only deal with banks, and so some other company failing, that's not our job. Congress can do it, and Congress did it, actually. Congress and the Treasury are the ones that came in and did the bailouts for the automakers, not the Fed. The Fed said, it's not our job. Jerome Powell, when he was asked in the COVID crisis, we lend to not bank companies, he said, we'll do anything we can to support the market. He said, yeah, happy to go beyond the Fed's rules, we'll lend to anybody to support the, to support the economy. State and local governments also, former Fed chairs had said, we should never be involved with that. Uh, for decades, there have been a couple of states that are sort of like on the brink of collapsing because they overspend every year and they don't bring in enough in taxes. And so that's their problem, right? And that's always what the Fed has said. Ben Bernanke too and Janet Yellen both said when they were at the Fed, we're not getting involved with state and local finance. You know, po politicians were pressuring them like, you need to come and bail out the state. It's gonna, it's gonna fail and that's gonna cause a problem for the economy. And they said, look, that's not our job. That state fails, that's their fault. You know, voters need to get in there and limit their spending so that the government doesn't fail. Um, when Jerome Powell was asked to do that, he said, we'll do anything we can to support people. That was a huge change that like, we thought, as, as an economist, like, we thought that that was basically the rule. Look, 
previous Fed chairs always said, that's not our job, we'll never do it. In fact, there's like a, a written agreement for the, between the Fed and the Treasury about what the Fed's supposed to do, and this ain't it. So we were pretty surprised when the Fed, you know, Jerome Powell's like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll end state and local governments. And of course, as soon as he said that, every senator was like, we need more money for my state, right? And so, you know, you worry now that next time we have even a drop in the stock market, even just a regular recession, maybe they're going to say, oh, it's an emergency. Oh, we need to lend all these states. Oh, any company that's having problems, we're willing to lend them. Right? That's the precedent that they've now set. That was pretty surprising and I think unfortunate. Um, after 2008, when the Fed went beyond its actual responsibilities, Congress in the Dodd-Frank Act said, no more of that. We're going to limit your powers and restrict what you're able to do. Is Congress going to do that this time? I don't know. It doesn't look like it. It seems like Congress liked the Fed bailing out state and local governments. And so it doesn't seem like there's going to be any major reforms to push that back. Um, student loans. You know, there's been a big question about Biden's uh, student loan program. This too, for, for decades, people have been pressuring the Fed to uh, take over all the student debt from the rest of the federal government and essentially forget it. Um, that's something they always said they would never do too, but now that they've broken the president on these other things, and now that student loan is such a big popular topic, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know why that would change. Um, climate policy, also something they said, hey, we've you know, never been involved with this. Uh, Bernanke, when I said, he said, we'll never bail out the automakers, he said, look, we're not supposed to be involved with industrial policy. The Fed is just supposed to do whatever supports the whole economy, not affect particular industries, and yet that's what, what they're doing now. They are, through the banking system, trying to tell banks, hey, you're not allowed to lend to energy companies. You're supposed to give discounts to green energy companies and not to fossil fuel companies. Now, they've actually been in the background doing this for years. When I was uh, at Senate Banking, we had a lot of banks that came in and said, okay, through enforcement, the Fed is pressuring us not to lend to fossil fuel companies, not to lend to gun companies, not to lend to marijuana companies, not to lend to now crypto companies, right? And so they're already internally uh, pressuring banks not to do that. This is just making it more efficient, right? Um, and so they're actively trying to steer funds in, in the economy you know, away from the fossil fuel industry into green energy projects. It seems like that's a problem. Congress didn't tell, it to do, tell them to do that. It's something that they're just doing on their own. Congress may have to do more of it. Um, there's also more political pressure in the people that are being nominated for the Fed. Two of the recent nominees, Sarah Boone Raskin and Lisa Cook, were both um, debated as to whether their policies had anything to do with monetary policy. Um, Sarah Boone Raskin had previously said, yeah, we should end the fossil fuel industry, or something like that. And so obviously that was. Know, uh, a problem and she ended up not getting confirmed. Um, Lisa Cook said the Fed should focus more on inequality and she was confirmed. So she you know, supports the kind of, kind of policies that they're doing change in addition to uh, those um, There's also legislation that, like I, I said earlier, there was the one that would require the Fed to eliminate racial disparities in wages, income, and wealth. So that's a, that's a big one right now. But also the Inflation Reduction Act, right? This is just recently passed. What did this do for the Fed? How did that affect the Fed? Well, there's a, there's a tweet from Joe Biden where he said, let me be clear, the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 would be the most important significant legislation in history to tackle the problem of inflation. I'm just kidding, he did not say that. <laughs> I, I doctored that quote, he actually said this, he said, the most significant legislation in history to tackle the climate crisis and to improve our energy security, right? So he, he's saying here, like, this is not about inflation. This is something that is about, you know, green energy and it, nothing to do with inflation. It's totally related to other programs that they want to get passed. They're just going to call it the Inflation Reduction Act to make it sound nice so that they can get some public support a euphemism to make it sound good for voters, even though he's saying, like, let me be clear, this is not about inflation, right? So that seems weird. It seems like, look, everyone realizes inflation is a problem. Politically pressuring the Fed to do things other than address the problem of inflation 
that seems like a bad idea. Right? And so what, what can we do to reform the Fed? Uh, we know that inflation is this problem. It seems like politics, more and more politics involved with the Fed, has caused them to ignore the problem of inflation um, and even create the problem of inflation by you know, going after uh, maximum employment, knowing that they were expanding the lots of inflation and not addressing that. So, um, so what can we do? Well, one thing is we could just give them one goal. Right? Instead of the dual mandate of inflation and unemployment where they can dodge and uh, bait and switch, if you give them one goal, that makes it a lot harder for them to um, miss it, right? Or, or make it clear if they're trying to address that one goal. You know? One of them that people have talked about for a long time and that some central banks have done is have a specific inflation target. They would have to target only inflation, not worry about unemployment, um, and that's something that is a lot easier to see whether they're doing a good job or not. Right? We can debate, like monetary economists, we, we debate about what the best rule would be, um, but basically all of the economists that say, look, the Fed should be following some kind of rule, we're like, any rule would be better than what they're doing now, right? Like this is, you know, saying they need a single goal is the most important part. Which goal is, is less important because there are several good ideas. Which one is the best is this debate. Another one is a uh, nominal GDP target nominal economic growth, we could just say, hey, the economy needs to grow at the same rate every year. Four or five percent a year, the Fed can set some target and try to consistently hit that target. That would be easier to tell if you're doing a good job or not. Another one that's a, um, a little bit more complicated, it's a Taylor rule. This is actually what a lot of people say the Fed was doing in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s when we had a good growing economy with low uh, inflation. And the Taylor Rule, what it does is, the Fed's got this dual mandate of inflation and unemployment, and it, instead of two goals, combines those into a single goal. And it says like, okay, we're gonna put, we're gonna say unemploy, uh, uh, unemployment gets some weight, and inflation gets some other weight, and we're gonna use this formula to make them into one single goal that's gonna determine the interest rates. Um, and so, you know, that's something else they can do. But regardless, all these things, the most important thing is like, give them one single target, right? When I, when I was at Senate Banking, uh, Senator Shelby used to say, used to say to the, the Fed officials, like, look, I don't want to sit on the FOMC and be setting monetary policy. I just want some way to tell if you're doing a good job or not, right? Let's just have some rule, and it doesn't even have to be a binding rule. It can just be a rule of thumb, and if you get it wrong, if you deviate from that rule, you just come in and tell us about it, right? Just write a report or come in and tell us, like, why did you change your policy to deviate from that rule? That would be a great idea, but why would the Fed want to do that? Like, if you were the Fed, why would you ever want to have to say you're wrong? They, they love having the dual mandate, because they can always, you know, uh, get out of jail and say, no, 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 it's just the other thing that we're worried about, right? They are very, very opposed to having any kind of rule, even if it's just a rule of thumb. Okay. In the longer term, I think we need to talk about more structural reforms. This, too, is something the Fed is totally afraid of. Um, the Fed was founded in 1913, and the structure of the Fed is totally weird by modern standards, and the way they operate is totally weird. And so I think some kind of restructuring is going to happen in the next couple of decades, um, but the, the Fed is super afraid of that. And I can understand why. They're afraid that politicians are just going to come in and not have any idea what a good policy is, and just totally rewrite the Fed and recreate it based on whatever is politically palatable at the time. I'm afraid of that too. And so I, I want economists, like I think we should be thinking a little bit more about what is a better structure of the Fed. Especially if it is the case, you know, they're saying like, look, we don't have the information to make monetary policy decisions. If that's true, we need to restructure it knowing that they're limited in their information, knowing that they're limited in their abilities, and make a better system for them. Right now they're set up to fail. It's hard for them to understand what's happening in the economy. Monetary policy acts in like year-long lags, and so they're really in an impossible situation to try to predict what's happening here in advance. We could maybe design a better um, system for them, and I think we potentially need more transparency and oversight. This too, if you're the Fed, you don't want this, but if you're Congress, if you're the American people, we want to see the Fed doing a good job. We want to see them getting inflation down um, so that we're not in the situation. So I don't know if any, things, any of these things will happen, but considering the problem that is inflation today, 
considering how serious it is for most Americans, I'm hopeful that somehow we'll get some policies changed that will make it better so that next time we have a crisis, we don't have this inflation problem. So thanks very much.